Wait a minute. Have you heard the whistler lately? I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Last Request. The group around Dr. Rourke's bed moved away as he beckoned with his last remaining strength, indicating that he wanted to be alone with his son. It was all right, the nurse decided, because his boy, James Rourke, was a doctor himself. He directed the others out, moved silently after them, and closed the door. James sat on the edge of the bed, listened at what his father had to say. It was an amazing story, something a dying man had to clear up. It wasn't really his own story, but that of one Tony Delgano, former public enemy number one. It was late, the steamer dock almost deserted, when the big car pulled up near the gangplank. And Tony Delgano stepped out and turned to the driver. Uh, Salini. Yeah, Tony? Not Tony, you fool. I'll be picked up before this tub even sails. Okay, okay, not Tony. What you got on your passport? Tony Delgano is no more. Now, David Delmas. Delmas? Kind of close, ain't it? It's got to be close so I don't slip. Now, you see that you don't. You do any singing, Salidi. Even one little bit. Why you always think I'm going to be the opera star? I don't sing to nobody. You see that you don't. Hey, you better go aboard, huh? And a uh, nice trip, Mr. Delmas. Yeah, sure. You got everything? Everything. I'll make it. If you behave. I always have. Well, so long, Chief. Don't take any lead slugs. So long. And you be careful. You watch from the rail as the lights from the Golden Gate fade into the distance. And you feel safe, secure, don't you, Tony? It's like the beginning of a new life. One that's free of the police. A new life under another name. David Delma. You enjoy it even more only a few hours later at a cocktail party on board. When you manage a meeting with a very exciting girl, Sharon Phillips. You feel a sense of amusement inside as... You introduce yourself in the ship's lounge. Uh, Delmas. David Delmas. It's a pleasure, Mr. Delmas. Oh, thank you. You know, they say, uh, they say shipboard friendships sometimes lead to all kinds of things, so, uh... (laughs) So may I get you another cocktail? If you like. A Manhattan, please. Sure. Oh, just a minute. Hmm? I want you to meet someone, an old friend. Oh, Doctor? Oh, Dr. Rourke. Dr. Rourke? Over here, Doctor. Oh, hello, Sharon. So you decided to take the trip after all. Dr. Rourke, uh, Mr. Delmar. Uh, happy How New Year. How do you do? Uh, I'll get the drink for you, Sharon. Oh, hurry back, won't you? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's a shock, isn't it, Tony, seeing Dr. Rourke. And you know that it surprised him, too. It's been a long time, hasn't it? And you know that you must talk to him alone and soon. He's gone when you return with Sharon Phillips' drink. But later, out on the deck, you see him standing by the aft rail, quietly smoking his pipe. You saunter over. Well, Doctor, we meet again, Dr. Rourke. Oh, yes. I wondered when you'd be cornering me alone, Mr. Delgano. Delmas. David Delmas. I don't suppose I have to ask you why you're traveling under an assumed name. 
the police again. The police again. But, Doc. Yes? You're going to keep my secret. Not say anything. Am I? Haven't said anything yet, have you? No. No, I haven't. Ah. Yeah, you're wise, Doc. You're very wise. I could mess up your life, too, you know. In what way? In what? <laughs> Come on now, Doc. Where's your memory? By the time you fixed up my shoulder after that hunting accident. I remember. Well, sure. And you remember that it wasn't a hunting accident at all. I learned that later, Taldy. Make that day, will you? Don't tell me what to make it. I'll say what I please, when and to whom. You can't threaten me, Delgado. No, no, Doc, of course not. <laughs> Your son, he's a doctor too, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yeah. Wonder how his associates would feel if they heard that his old man, Dr. Rock Sr., that once helped a criminal, never said anything about it. My son, you wouldn't... I wouldn't? I would. You just forget about Tony Delgado. Or your son, young Dr. Rock, would have his life messed up because of something his father did. I see. Mm -hmm. You're running away, I suppose. Yeah, you suppose good, Doc. And what are you doing here? One of your own prescriptions, huh? Little sea voyage? I'm doing a favor for a friend. Oh? The on board? Yes. Well, don't go getting any ideas you can tell him about me. I don't want anyone to know, Doc, till I'm free and clear. Then, of course, it doesn't make any difference. I understand. You just skip mentioning anything to your friend. You understand that, too? It would scarcely matter if I did. Huh? My friend is making a last voyage. Oh? Uh -huh. His body is in a casket in the hold. Oh. I'm escorting him to... to his final resting place. His last request. Uh. Well, okay, Doc. I guess you won't do any talking. So, uh, I'll see you around. Not if I can avoid it. <laughs> oh, did I hurt your feelings, old man, huh? <laughs> uh, you forget about that, see? I'll call on you any time for anything. And you'll do whatever Tony Delgano says. Oh. I'm sorry, I forgot my new name. Delmas. David Delmas. He speaks a little differently from Delgano. Delmas is going to be a real gent. But he's the same guy, Doc. The same guy. <laughs> Before continuing with Whistler's strange tale, here's a word from the people who are bringing it to you. All of us are proud of our hometowns, and rightly so. In this brief moment before we continue with our program, we'd like to offer a salute to one of our hometowns in America, Cleveland, Ohio. The seventh largest city in the United States. Cleveland was founded in 1796 by General Moses Cleveland, chief surveyor for a land company. His employers bought three million acres in what is now northern Ohio, paying 40 cents an acre. Just by way of comparison, an acre in downtown Cleveland today would bring some $2 million. It is an important Great Lakes shipping point and the site of iron and steel manufacturing. Other Cleveland products include paints, varnishes, electrical appliances, chemicals, and automobile and airplane parts. It is well known for its cultural developments also. The city owns and operates its own dramatic theater. And the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra is widely acclaimed. In the Cleveland Cultural Gardens, a mile-long strip of park area, more than 30 nationality groups represented in Cleveland's population are creating gardens as memorials to peace. 120 years is a short time in the world's history, but during that time, Cleveland has taken its honored place in the building of America. Now, back to the Whistler.
It's clear sailing again, isn't it, Tony? As David Delmas, you're safe on the ship. Not a worry. <laughs> Dr. Rourke will say nothing. Because he's afraid that his son, a young doctor with a bright future, will be hurt by the knowledge that his father once helped a criminal. He took a bullet out of your shoulder, didn't he, Tony? After a bank job. He said nothing then. And it's the same now after all these years. He'd be safe. You think very little about it the next few days. You're too busy with that girl, Sharon Phillips. She's exciting, isn't she, Tony? And seemingly very interested in you. Uh, there it is. Oh, you <laughs> what again, David. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm no shuffleboard player. <laughs> David, uh, I, I like you to call me that, Sharon. Do you? I'm no shuffleboard player, either. Let's... Uh, Get away from here, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's better. David. Hmm? What do you do? You work on me. Why do you ask? Mm, no reason, except that... Well, we have been seeing a good deal of one another. I asked Dr. Rourke if he knew anything what about... What did he say? Nothing. Hmm. Nothing at all. That's why I asked you. Uh-huh. Well, Sharon, I'm just a guy moving around, uh, uh, seeking. Seeking? Yeah. Uh, something, uh, someone, someone like you. David, the steward's coming. Yeah. I don't think... Oh, that fool. Yeah, what is it, steward? Mr. Delmas, might I see you alone, sir? Sure, we'll dance, huh? Twice around the main floor. What do you want? Lighter then, sir. Alone? Look, what is this? Oh, I don't mind, David. Uh, I'll join you later. Hmm? In the salon. Yeah, well, not much later. About ten minutes, Sheriff. All right, now, boy. Easy, Tony. Oh, I might not like that. Tony, would you get I've that? I've seen your picture. So, this Delgano, this radiogram for Mr. David Delmas from San Francisco. Get ready here. Salidia singing received well here. Anticipate big reception for you in Australia. Double crossing little squealer. Tips that's off the police, eh? Wherever I get my hands. Save your breath, Mr. Delgano. You could still lick him from here. You've got a Sunday punch. I have? Yes, your friend, Dr. Rourke. What about Rourke? He's escorting a stiff, ain't he? So? Low lover, Doc. What's to prevent us from disposing of his quiet friend? You take his place in the casket, go ashore as nice as you please. And nobody's the wiser. Huh. Uh, you're a bright boy, boy. What's your end of it? Just give me a bit of help, that's all. Give you a bit of help? Yes, sir. Maybe you could get a little package ashore for me. What's in the package? A million dollars in diamonds, Mr. Delgado. You just take it with you. I'll pick it up after you're safely ashore. What do you say? I'll think it over. I'll get in touch with you. All right, sir. But remember, it's your only chance. It's a way out, isn't it, Tony? But you're not certain you want to take it. You tell yourself there must be another way you can escape the police who will be waiting for you when your boat docks at Sydney. In the days that follow, you search for the answer find yourself thinking more and more of the steward's plan. And then one evening, as you stroll along the half-deserted deck... Good evening, Mr. Delmas. Beautiful night, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is, steward. Oh, do you happen to have a light? Righto. Here you are, sir. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasant voyage, wouldn't you say, sir? Too bad it'll all be over soon. Doc, the day after tomorrow, you know. Yeah, 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 I know. By the way, Mr. Delmas, uh, Miss Phillips has been inquiring about you. What? Asked if I'd seen you. She's in the lounge. Oh, oh, yeah. Thanks. Nice young lady, that Miss Phillips. Seems uh, quite taken by you. 
If I may say so, sir. Is that so? Oh, yeah, boys, you know, yes, sir. Very attractive woman. Lots of money, too, I hear. Too bad if anything happened to spoil your beautiful friendship. Like the police. Eh, hey, Mr. Thomas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be too bad. Eh, uh, you been thinking any more about my proposition? I'm sure I've been thinking about it. It's, uh, it's a deal. Yeah, it's a deal. Bring the package to my stateroom in ten minutes. Here's the package, sir. All wrapped up nice and proper like. Yeah. Not a very big one, is it? Not very. It's worth a million dollars. Uh. Hey, what's your cut on this? 20000 on delivery. Uh. All right, beat it. I'll take care of things from now on. Oh, uh, is Dr. Rourke in on it? Not yet, but I can handle him. You understand, sir. That pot's between you and the dog. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, uh, got to get topside. Uh. Hey, just a minute. Uh. Come here, come here. Yes, sir. How am I supposed to get this package to you after I'm ashore? <laughs> Don't worry, Tony. I'll be close by. All the time. After he's left your cabin, your gaze wanders back to the small package lying on the desk. You stare at it for a moment, and quickly you walk over to it, rip it open. You're examining the contents of the package when quickly you close the box. Slip it into the desk drawer. Uh, all right, come in. Oh. I was beginning to wonder where you disappeared to. Oh, I was just on my way up to the lounge. The Fenways have asked a few people to their stateroom. Want to go along? <laughs> have I been invited? <laughs> have you? Mrs. Fenway won't take no for an answer. Oh, well, what's the occasion? Nothing special. Just some drinks. And cards, I suppose. Mrs. Fenway has suddenly discovered the game of blackjack. She's crazy about it. <laughs> oh, well, she starts losing. <laughs> Come on, David. Fenways are waiting. Yeah, so am I. Look, I, I, I've got to go up on deck for a minute, Sharon, so why don't you run along and I'll, I'll join you later, huh? All right, but... Yeah, you, you go on. Honey. It's important I take care of this matter right away. Very important. Mr. Delmos, I, I didn't see you. It's rather dark here. Yeah, yeah you... it's nice and dark. Uh, oh, for a bit of a stroll? Yeah, I am. Join me. Well, I... Come I, on. I, I, I... It's business. You'd like to make ten grand easily, wouldn't you, Stuart? Ten grand, sir? Ten grand. When I left the States, there was a reward out on me. Ten grand. Is that so, sir? Yeah, yeah, that's so. Of course, you knew about that, didn't you? Why, no. No, no I, I didn't, you sir. You figured you'd kind of like to collect that, didn't you? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, they hide me out where the cops couldn't find me, and then you would lead them to me, huh? How am I doing so? Well, that's crazy, sir. Why would I turn you in for ten grand when you're holding a package for me that's worth twenty? Uh-uh. I opened it, buster. You... You open it? Yes. All I found was a handful of glass. No, how no, about oh, that? Oh, now, hold on, wait a minute. You, you got me all wrong, I sir. don't think so. No, what are you going to do, sir? You're a smart little punk. No, sir, no, sir. Let's see if you ever learned how to swim. <laughs> the steward won't bother you anymore. Sharon and the rest of the passengers will think he's fallen overboard. When you retire for the night, you're confident you're in the clear, but your plan can't fail. Then the following morning, there's a knock on your stateroom door. Come in. Your 
directly sent. Oh. Oh, yeah, thank you. Oh, you can set it down over there if you want. Uh, yes, sir. There you are. Hey, uh, aren't you new here? Where's the regular steward I had? Well, it's rather odd, sir. He's disappeared. What? The ship's been searched. He isn't aboard. You sure? Yes, sir. One of the passengers on the deck last night thought he heard a splash. You mean the steward might have fallen overboard? That's exactly what might have happened, Mr. Dunmire. Morning, Dr. Rourke. Good morning. That'll be all, Stuart. I guess you think you did, my friend. Too bad about the steward falling overboard, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, tough. But then... Accidents will happen. I don't think it was an accident. Yeah. Oh, join me, Doctor. Thanks. Thanks. I've already had breakfast. Mm. They sure look good. You sure you won't? No. Rather just pace up and down, huh? Okay. Mm. You were saying, Doctor? It wasn't an accident, was it? Accident? Oh, you mean the steward? How does it feel to be a murderer? I've often wondered. <laughs> Have some coffee, Doctor. He knew too much about you, didn't he? I noticed from the first day when he saw us talking together. He was rather inquisitive in a guarded sort of way. Probably recognized you. Well, he was a smart little operator, Doc. But not smart enough. I tell you, I kind of hated to do it. Especially after he'd given me that bright idea. What bright idea? Yeah, how did they keep the toast warm all the way to the cabin? What idea? Hmm? Oh, way of getting off the boat. See, Dr. Police are going to be waiting for me when the boat docks in Sydney. What? Yeah. yeah. Doc, will you sit down? You're making me nervous. That's better. Now, it's going to be tough, you know, for both of us if they grab me. They're kind of tough on your son, too. What are you going to do? Well, there's a way I can slip past him. If you'll help. And I'm pretty certain that you will, Doc. Uh, how? How can I help? Well, you told me you're accompanying an old friend to his final resting place. Huh? Yes. That's right. And that's but how I'm you... going to slip off of this boat. They'd never think of looking there for me. Oh, you... You're not suggesting you're that... You're right that... again, Doc. We're going to make a switch. No, no, I... No, I, I I, can't do that. I won't. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. You know something more? You're going to keep your mouth shut. Or you know what happens to your son, hmm? Now beat it, will you? Well, Listen I to me. We're going to be docking tomorrow night. I'll let you know in plenty of time. You watch Dr. Rourke as he backs out of your stateroom. A stunned, horrified look on his face. You're not worried, are you, Tony? You know he'll go through with it for his son's sake. You spend the rest of the day with Sharon, enjoying the deck game, chatting pleasantly with the other passengers. And then early that evening, when you've finished dressing for dinner, you pour yourself a drink. A knock on your stateroom door interrupts your first sip. One of the ship's officers steps into the room. Yeah, what is it? I should have to ask you to come with me, sir. Oh? Captain wants to see you. Well, what about? But look, if you come quietly, Mr. Delgano. Delgano? Yes. We've just received a radiogram from the San Francisco police. Oh, yeah, I see. <laughs> you don't mind if I finish my drink, do you? Oh, would you care for one? If you just come with me, sir. Oh, come on. Have a drink. <laughs> An instant after you throw the drink in his face, your fist connects with his chin, and he slumps to the floor. Quickly, you close the door, stand for a moment with your back to it, your mind spinning wildly. They've discovered you now, haven't they, Tony? You've got to move fast. Leaving the unconscious officer sprawled out on the floor... You hurry to Dr. Rock's state. That's room. what I said now. It's got to be now. But we don't dock until tomorrow. But as soon as that officer wakes up, they're going to be tearing this boat inside out looking for me. Please, tell Castle, don't ask me to. I haven't got time to argue. You get going. I'm going to wait right here for you. The minute. 
minutes drag by, and you wait for Dr. Rourke to return, pace his stateroom floor, stopping occasionally to pour yourself a drink from the decanter on the nightstand. An hour goes by, and then finally... Oh, hey, look, where have you been? I, 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 I had to be careful. All right, is everything all set? Yes, yes, yes I, I just had a talk with the captain. Will you double oh, no, 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 wait. I... I told him I thought I saw you trying to hide in one of the lifeboats. Saw you lose your footing. Oh. Oh, I see. The ship is circling the area now. Well, that's smart of you, Doc. That's pretty smart. Hey, that calls for a drink. Uh, I could use one. Yes, sir. (laughs) I see you've helped yourself. Oh, sure, I had a few. Make me feel better while I'm... Resting in that box down below. Tony, there's something I've got to tell you. I know all I need to know. Now, come on, you finish your drink, see? Then we're going to go down to the hold, and you can make me nice and comfortable. Tony, I said, come on, I don't want to talk about it no more. Very well. You seem to be giving the orders. Before continuing with the Whistler's strange story, here's something everybody's for. We're for the U.S., we're for the United Nations, we want war to cease. We're for the U.N., cause the U.N. stand for permanent peace. And now for the Whistler's ending to his story for tonight. In stunned silence, young Dr. Rourke sat on the edge of his father's bed, listening to the dying man as he told his story in a voice that had now faded to a bare whisper. The end was near for old Dr. Rourke, and as his son James leaned forward to catch the last few remaining words, an expression of pain crossed his face. Dad. Dad, you let Tony Del Gano get away. No. No, son. He didn't get away. But you let him take another man's place in the casket. Your friend. Yes, he... He took my friend's place in the casket. The body I was accompanying to its final resting place. But, you see, there was something Tony Delgano didn't know. What? What's that, Dad? That my friend had chosen as his final resting place a burial at sea. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as The Whistler, with Lawrence Dobkin, Herb Butterfield, Gene Tatum, Jack Moyles, and Paul Dubois. The Whistler, directed by Sterling Tracy, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is produced by Joel Malone and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This evening's story was by Brian Thorne. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarities of names or resemblances to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Whistler, whose strange story you have just heard, will be back next week with another tale from his never-ending file. 
This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.